Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm a philosopher and a meditation teacher, and I think that's sufficient for my purposes in terms of introduction. I've already received a very elegant one from my friend Kay. So let's go into the provocation itself, shall we? Uh, this piece is entitled Liberation from Our Modern Purgatory. And I want it to reach those with ears to hear, those who are here today, as well as those who are listening to the, to the recording. Section one, material civilization. What is a chief mark, a distinguishing characteristic of our time, of the particularly anomalous epoch in which we live? The perennialist René Guénon argues that it is materialism, indeed, that material civilization is a material, indeed, to date, the material civilization. And material civilization wants my head to be shown here. So let me see if I can. I've got you on spotlight. OK, this is better already, so I don't have to see myself. Material civilization is uh, doing what it does well here. OK, so here we have material civilization to return. Riley, Gaino observes, and it is acerbic, the crisis of the modern world a book first uh, published in 1927, that is only five years after the end of World War I, that materialism could be said to, quote, denote a conception according to which nothing else exists but matter and its derivatives. But he then goes on to say that he'll offer up a very different sort of definition, one grasped in terms of a certain mentalité. He expounds thus. This state of mind is one that consists in more or less consciously putting material things and the preoccupations arising out of them in the first place. Whether these preoccupations claim to be speculative or purely practical. And it cannot be seriously disputed that this is the mentality of the immense majority of our contemporaries, end quote. A couple of things at least are noteworthy about this stunning passage. First of all, Guénon, unwilling to abstract us from materialism by speaking of matter being fundamental, throws it right in our faces. This is how you think, he implies. This is how you see. This is how you behave. You think in terms of material objects. You feel in a sentimental way that as you're moved in a dewy-eyed way by sights and sounds and by tear-jerking stories, lower impulses, and so on. You see numbers, you crave financial success, and you strive, strive rather for more of the same. And indeed, he would go on to say, you are not alone. This is a collective state of mind, a collective way of seeing. Second of all, for Gaynon, it doesn't matter whether the person in question is Richard Dark Dawkins, rather, who's keen to reduce everything to evolution, that is, to the generation transformation of matter, or any guy on the street griping about how much he pays in taxes. Both only care about stuff, sophisticatedly or naively understood. It would be wise for you to check yourself now to see yourself in this mirror. Isn't what Gaynon is saying directly applicable to you, to many, if not all of us? But Gaynon is not yet done with his indictment of material civilization, for at this point he appeals, as my father used to do when I was a kid, to the apparently immediate force of common sense. So he writes, Common sense consists in not going beyond the things of this earth, as well as in ignoring that all that does not make immediate practical appeal. You might speak of utility. here. In particular, it is common sense that sees only the world of the senses as real, 
that I can touch, taste, smell, and so forth, and that admits of no knowledge other than the one that comes from the senses, end quote. We're beginning to smell, my words, not his, a profound anti-intellectualist, not to say also an anti-heart centric conception that will burst forth into a pat empiricism. If I can't touch it, then it probably ain't so. A smug pragmatism, what's the use of this whole sacred poetry thing anyway? And not the least, a flattening out of reality. That flattening out of reality is most palpable in what he'll elsewhere call the reign of quantity. And what still in the crisis of the modern world will amount to an obvious and obviously limited viewpoint, which is decidedly humanistic or anthropocentric. He concludes in this dispensation that there is no, there can apparently be, quote, no reality higher than the human, end quote. Our fixation on material objects, it seems, is at one with our fixation on ourselves, a kind of species-wide narcissism. So that's the opening gambit. Section two, total work and the goods life. Almost 100 years after the writing of the crisis of the modern world, that is today, we find ourselves in a position to observe two significant developments in material civilization. The first I began writing about in 2017, it goes by the name of total work, a term I borrow from the Catholic philosopher Joseph Pieper. The second is mentioned, if only in passing, in Brad, Brad, Brad Gregory's fine piece of research on the Protestant Reformation and its aftermath, namely the unintended Reformation, how a religious revolution secularized society. Consider the first. Total work is a total pseudo-philosophy or false philosophy, one anchored in the belief that work is the alpha and omega that it is the first and that it shall also be the last. Still today, some five years after I began writing about the subject and about one year after I ceased doing so in public, I find it disheartening that someone at all, let alone someone like me needs to emphasize again and again and again, the absurdity of putting work as well as the fruits of work in such a central place, not just in one's own life, but also in society at large. In a very specific sense, it is, mark this, utterly foolish. It's an utterly foolish thing to do, for in placing it in this way, this pursuit cuts us off from the realization, as I'll discuss later on, that this sacrifice amounts to the forgetfulness of our highest spiritual aspirations, our noblest aspirations. The very reason why we're here to repeat such a move is unwise as well as profane, idolatrous, one might even say heretical. For we can't have it both ways. We can't put work in the first place and also realize our reason for being during this lifetime. Total work knows this, however, and so it lies by saying that our highest reason for being is to work. Hence the endless task or talk of task there, talk of callings and of vocations and of finding and of using your gifts, of realizing your highest potential, and so on and so on. It's all a bunch of bunk, nonsense, claptrap, hocus pocus, pseudo spiritual mumbo jumbo. This is in brief, if I may speak eloquently, some pretty super fucked up shit. Really? I turn now to the consumption side of the material civilizational equation. In 1899, American sociologist Thorsten Feblen, Veblen rather, published his The Theory of the Leisure Class. The leisure class he saw flexed to their social power and status through sophisticated optics. 
their distance from the working class was starkly visible and their antipathy toward anything smacking of work. Wealth brought them time and possessions and both allowed them to show themselves off. Rather than simply having portraits painted of them, they themselves could become the portraits worthy of the admiration and the envy of others. They were in a sense what they were. This is bling and no doubt it's still with us today. But I don't think among general, younger generations anyway, that this is how the goods life most perniciously shows up at this stage of capitalism or material civilization. In lieu of privileging the conspicuous consumption of luxury goods, younger people by and large are clinging on to experiences. The best goods still material I must point out are experiences to be pursued and consumed and shared and resonate. This is not as the Indian sage and Sargadatha would have it anything close to authentic spirituality, nor is it a genuine spiritual path. Instead, it's spiritual materialism. A term coined, a term Trinkman Prabhupada used in his book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, and hence, by my lights, it is nothing but the building up of a pseudo-spiritual CV on behalf of the puffed up ego. Two sides of the equation, production side and the consumption side of material civilization today. Please don't overlook the bind we're in, the vice grip that you're in. On one side is the hollowness of total work, of being an agent seeking to bring about maximum social positive impact or of some profound transformation. While on the other is the goods life whose point is to optimize for as many and as varied peak experiences as possible. What a fantastic, phantasmagoric dead end indeed. Section three, modernity as purgatory. With a view to concentrating deeply on the particular state of modernity we find ourselves in now, I turn to four pregnant lines from the opening prayer, a prayer rather of the Quran, a prayer recited daily in Arabic by devout Muslims. <clears throat> Quote, guide us Lord upon the straight path the path of those on whom thy grace is, not those on whom thy anger is, nor those who are astray, end quote. This translation comes from Said Hossein Nasser's book on Sufism, the title of which is The Garden of Truth, The Visions and Promise of Sufism, Islam's Mystical Tradition. In his interpretation of these lines, Nasser brings out the vertical and horizontal dimensions of human life. Quote, our existential situation, he writes, can be further clarified by recourse to geometrical symbolism. We are situated at the point of the intersection of the vertical and horizontal axes of a cross. We have a choice to ascend the vertical axis and be among those on whom thy grace is, or to descend on the same axis into ever lower states of being as one on whom thine anger is. Finally, we can wander along the horizontal line of the cross among those who go astray. Eschatologically, about that term more in a little while, these three possibilities, up, down, side to side, correspond from a certain perspective to the paradis paradisal, infernal, and purgatorial states. His last reference, of course, is to Dante's The Divine Comedy. In my view, modernity does not relegate us to the inferno, but rather to a purgatorial state. This purgatorial time I submit is characterized most overtly by a sense of pathlessness. I can't underscore that point enough. We are living in a time of pathlessness. For we modern Westerners have been led astray and many of us remain astray all the while without knowing 
any the better. Now, if we're fortunate, then something in life may throw us asunder, a death, an itineracy, uh, grateful and suffering, so that we may discover just how totally lost and unaccountably confused we truly are. If such doesn't happen, however, we shall continue to wander about heedlessly, blindly, unconsciously, automatically. In this connection, I'm reminded of a powerful passage from Peter Kingsley's book called Simply Reality. It's a book about uh, Parmenides and Empedocles. I quote him at some length here. Quote, the expression to it being totally at a loss is built around exactly the same word used to describe the state in which Socrates plunged the people he spoke with. And that word is aporia or pathlessness. Aporia, just like a mechenia, is a state of utter helplessness. It describes the nightmare, finding yourself in the impossible situation where no path leads to where you are and no path leads from it. All of a sudden, you're trapped, lost. No conceivable plan or trick will help. You see no way out of this rootlessness. And so I say to you, may you find yourself rootless, deeply rootless, so that the path can, out of grace, open up to you. Section four, pseudopaths. One impediment to recognizing our pathlessness are all the pseudopaths on offer in material civilization. I'll we'll point to just three and what follows. All three of these can be reduced to a, quote, preoccupation with material objects, end quote, even as each gains in greater and greater sophistication. These three pseudopaths, which I borrow from Huston Smith's very nice The World's Religions, and which are not called pseudo in his book, by the way, are the following. The pseudopath of pleasure, the pseudopath of worldly success, and the pseudopath marked this one of service to others. I quote Smith at great length. He's referring to the second one, namely the one concerned with worldly success, but the logic applies to all three. We can describe, he states, the typical experience of the second type, namely that concerned with worldly success. The world's visible rewards still attract them strongly. They throw themselves into enjoyment, enlarging their holdings and advancing their status. But neither the pursuit nor the attainment brings true happiness. Some of the things they want, they fail to get. And this makes them miserable, or we'd say today at least disappointed and frustrated. Some they get and hold on to for a while, only to have them suddenly snatched away. And again, they are miserable. Some they get and keep only to find that they do not bring the joy that was expected. A sense of ennui or emptiness may ensue. He goes on, many experiences that thrilled at first pale, I'm sorry, at first pale on the hundredth. Throughout each attainment seems to fan the flames of new desire. The Buddha would have called craving None satisfies fully, and all that becomes evident perish with time. Eventually, there comes over them the suspicion that they are caught on a treadmill, having to run faster and faster for rewards that mean less and less. End quote. Don't be misled at the end by the treadmill analogy. The book was written in 1958, I believe. Perhaps more often, or so it's, so it's been true in my experience with people, each pseudopath founders and ultimately fails quite often due to boredom or ennui. The taste of pleasure, one chocolate bar, uh, one sexual escapade, a thousand, 10,000, and so forth, becomes 
10,000 times later insipid. Or the second one, the striving after more and more success ultimately turns into a kind of futility. And the egocentric service to others is revealed as just another way to keep score. So even service to others is often an ego trip, not to say also an ego trap. How tragic all this is, just more stuff of a more sophisticated nature, none of which is satisfying ultimately, and each and all of which are leaving us out of sorts, listless, gnawing, benumbed. Section five, religio and sacred knowledge. We're left, I think, with a stark choice. Continue to be pathless or pseudopathless or open widely to religio, religion. I must pause for a moment because maybe the transition wasn't clear. When I state that we're pathless, what tends to happen is that a surrogate conception supervenes on our sense of pathlessness and throws us a bone. We grab onto it and don't realize that we're pathless. So you think you have a path when you have a career path. It's not a path. It's a pseudo path. You can cock some kind of narrative. You think that's a path. It's not a path. All these are surrogates. All these are air sots. They're fake gems. But they detain us for a while. They throw us off realizing what we're here to realize. To continue. That's the, that's the choice then. So posed between pathlessness or pseudopathlessness or opening wide to religion. Yes, I just used the word religion. Shocking. Uh, very, very out of, very, very, very uncouth today. For religio from the Latin refers to binding or really to rebinding man to God. And this is precisely what's needed more than ever today. Vertical dimension. Consider that embedded within any genuine religion is the spiritual path. So today I speak about genuine religion. I'm not interested in uh, new atheist arguments about bloodshed and so on and so forth. We've seen plenty of bloodshed in the 20th century from secular humanism as well. This is not an interesting argument. This is beside the point. I'm talking about genuine religion, what it does best, the essence of it. So it provides us with a spiritual path of a genuine sort. The point of the spiritual path then is to bring about sacred knowledge or sacred love, though I only touch upon the former during this talk. For as the Dalai Lama often says, this is a standard, standard line, everybody wants to be happy, nobody wants to suffer. Who can disagree with this unless he or she begs the question by assuming that he or she already has knowledge of the nature of happiness. Now, in this talk, I define happiness as whatever it is that we ultimately seek. <clears throat> but whatever it is that we ultimately seek must meet at least two conditions. Firstly, that the object be permanent. And secondly, secondly rather, that it be complete. For if it's not permanent, then it's transient. And our souls, I argue, cannot be satisfied by transients, or what Hindus and Buddhists both call samsara. I invite you to contemplate again the inherent problem with pseudopaths already discussed. They can't but terminate in transients, and therefore in unsatisfaction. And if it is incomplete, some path or other, some pseudo path, then as the Buddha saw, it will necessarily generate selfish craving or tanha. And that selfish craving is, as the Rolling Stones rightly sung, such that I can't get no satisfaction. Completeness entails can't get no satisfaction. Hence, there is no way of getting around these two necessary, not sufficient, necessary conditions 
save on pain of half-hearted, limp-wristed acquiescence to nihilism. But then note this, well, only God, or what is the same thing, the ultimate, the real, whatever you wish to call this, only God is permanent and complete. Therefore, what we ultimately seek is God. That is the only way to be abidingly happy is to be one with God, one with the ultimate, one with the real, one with the true. Happiness, to find a second time with greater specificity now, is nothing but knowledge or love of God. Again, happiness, set aside love, happiness is nothing but knowledge of God. The path to God, as Frithof Schuon has observed, is at once metaphysical, metaphysical cosmological, and eschatological. And I won't take you through this long uh, uh, morass bit here, but I'll say a little bit. Metaphysics is, in Gainon's words, the science of the universal, the principle, the absolute, the beyond being, the unconditioned, the one without a second. All this non-dual language that a few of you may be familiar with. It is the, the groundless ground. Cosmology, then, from the vantage point of esoteric religion, describes the manifestation of the absolute in and as the universe or nature. In other words, cosmology is concerned with manifestation from this point of view. <clears throat> we might say that the metaphysical cosmological points to the descent of the transcendent into and as the imminent. God is throwing us a bone, so to say. Meanwhile, eschatology, brief aside, eschatology is the doctrine or science of liberation, the end of suffering, you might say. Meanwhile, eschatology is the ascent, is the way home or the liberation from all that ails us, the knowledge that unbinds and frees us totally. Eschatology is liberation in the form of knowledge where that knowledge frees us, that is the knowledge of the ultimate. Therefore, we need both. We need both a theoretical understanding of the nature of reality, the descent, the metaphysics and cosmology, as well as the deep intuitive experiential knowledge that to put it in the language of Sufism, there is no God but God. There is no real but real, that's the ascent. In other words, brief aside, we simply can't get by with our psychological time where we're going to just endlessly look at the interior contents of a single consciousness. This is jouissance. This is just the, this is just samsara by another name. We need metaphysics. We need to, we can't simply live on flatland. We need metaphysics. We need to see ourselves within the general scheme of things and then realize ourselves within this general scheme. In any case, together, these comprise sacred knowledge, theoretical understanding and realization. And it is sacred knowledge that is ananda, the sacred Sanskrit word for abiding peace beyond words. Ananda, sacred peace, abiding peace. The peace whether we know it or not, whether we know it or not, we all seek. Section six, the final section, two very practical recommendations. Before I make these recommendations, uh, I'm going to just kind of reset the argument here. So it seems to me that we basically have a choice. I'm going to simplify the choice. The choice is between nihilism and knowing God. So nihilism often shows itself in the form of endless self-improvement projects. That's nihilism. That's the view according to which there's no reason for living beyond endless life hacking. That's samsara. So there must be some reason for being, 
that situates the human within all of this. If not, we're reduced to arbitrary actions, arbitrary goals, and in the end, the sense that life itself was arbitrary and futile. We're left with existentialism. French philosophy, I completely disagree with. So we have nihilism on one side. On the other side is knowing God. This is our choice. This is what it sort of modernity boils it down to. Purgatorial nihilism or knowledge of God. Second thing I'd like to say before I bring, before I come to my very practical recommendations is to refer to a, an interview with Frithoff Schuon, or actually with his, his, his late wife. Uh, <clears throat> details of his life don't really matter she, for our purposes here. His wife says very beautifully the following in a certain documentary, quote, Shuan's function, she states, in the world is really to bring people back to practice their religion, to bring them back to a path that leads to God. Many people have gone back and practiced their religion very seriously after having read his books. He wants to help us to go back to where we belong, end quote. I would second that. In this talk, I'm seeking to bring you back to where you belong, back to where we all belong. <clears throat> In closing, I'd like to offer you two very practical recommendations, as promised. The first pertains to modern hubris, pride, arrogance, self-righteousness. Don't make the mistake of believing that you can make up some form of a la carte spirituality on your own. This is a very, very bad idea. It's ego talking, and it's also especially dangerous. Shamanism on Monday, crystals on Tuesday, Reiki healing on Wednesday. This is not it. This is a very, very egocentric idea. And I say this right now so that you can avoid all that. <clears throat> Which brings me quite naturally to my second recommendation. I love this one. If you were raised in a religious household, and if upon graduating from high school or college, you fancied yourself an agnostic or an atheist, who didn't, then you do well, and I did, then you do well, provided your heart has been opened a bit today, to return to religio, the binding of you with what is beyond you, and to give it an honest try this time. You might as well begin by seeing with fresh eyes whether this religion articulates a higher purpose, I mean that in a genuine sense, whether it makes sense of life's basic questions. You might as well. You might as well begin with the tradition from whence you came. Later on, you may discover that it doesn't set you on the path. Yet, were that to be your well-reasoned conclusion, then at least you'd have settled the matter through the use of introspection, as well as through genuine participation. Besides, that conclusion will then helpfully point you to a religion, religious path, that may be more suitable to you at this stage of your life. Remember though, the question is not, what has religion got to offer me? But instead, what have I to offer this religion? What do I have to offer? In short, don't be stubborn and selfish. If, however, you were raised in a fundamentalist household or some such, and with reasonable reservations, you can't justify returning to it, then, another recommendation, I can do no better than to recommend that you take up Zen. You might think here at the end of my talk that I'm evangelizing, which is not really in the spirit of Zen anyway, but in truth, I'm not, since in actuality, I'm a Vedantin at heart, beyond the scope of this talk. So I'm not fully Zen, I'm Vedantin. I recommend Zen for the simple reason that it will allow you to learn how, through Zazen, seated practice, to sit on a cushion, to become quiet, and for the time being, not to worry about theoretical expositions of the kind briefly sketched just above. It's not surprising that Zen was so appealing to a good number of Catholics and Jews and others 
after it came to the United States in the 1950s, 60s, up to the 80s, for what it presented was an opening through solitude and silence to the great mystery that we, for lack of a better word, insist on calling God. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, mm -hmm. I think I need some dark chocolate, a cocktail, and a viral tweet to uh, make myself feel alive again. Um, I guess uh, I'll 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 kick it off with with a I don't even know if it's a, I have so many questions yet no questions, uh, and then we'll kind of go through a kind of Zoom hand raise Q and A. Thank you. Um, the question, I think it's, it's much earlier in the, con you know, it's, it's, it precedes the conclusion or the cult, the climax, uh, by, by a few steps, but it is a question around utility. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes in, you know, you mentioned er impact and service. What, what is the trap? Let's say you can abandon like personal utility, like I do this action or I'm on this path to better myself. And you can shift that and say, I'm on this path, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a pseudopath. It's probably a pseudopath by your terminology mm -hmm. to benefit others. And then you add a, an extra qualifier which you warned about, which is it's, a, it's in a non-egoic way. So I don't know, take like um, Charles Feeney. He was the, 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 bil the billionaire who like hid from everyone. Like no one, he didn't want anyone to know that he was a billionaire. He lived in a studio apartment and, and what he wanted to do was he was, I think before Steve Schwartzman at Yale, a Blackstone in Yale, was the largest single person donor to the American university system. And okay. he didn't want anyone to know about it. And he had no worldly possessions other than a you know studio apartment and a, a Casio watch. In listening to your talk, is that like that seems in, insufficient, or that's still a pseudo? You would I think you would still call that a pseudopath. But how would you juxtapose that with? It, it's hard to argue that you know his actions. It's hard to argue against the fact that his actions have been hugely beneficial to society. Mm -hmm. So how does that, how do you, how does one, and I recognize that like, look, I teach productivity courses. I have gone through phases in my life where I think that that is uh, actual service to humanity. And I've spent enough time with you to detach myself from that um, egoic sense of thinking. But um you know, you have this, if you have this sliver of folks that is utility, non-egoic utility driven, is that, how does that fit into the framework of pseudopaths and the, that same, I would suspect that you're, you would argue that Chuck Feeney is still moving towards the path of nihilism based, you know, based on outside information. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Someone asked me that question this morning, so I think I have an answer to it. <laughs> um, Birds of a feather, we all, we're all thinking. It's, it, it's, it's not, uh, uh, had I had more time, I would have added more qualifiers here and there. It's not as though being of service to others is a bad thing, but you're mistaking, I'm not a utilitarian, so I'll speak in virtue ethics terms. You're mistaking the cultivation of virtue, in this case, generosity, for the ultimate reason for being here. So it's an order of operations problem. You first want to discover, when I say first, I mean logically and metaphysically, I don't mean chronologically. You first want to discover why you're here. And then you'll find that being of service to all beings, not just human beings, by the way, not just human beings, by the way, being of service to all beings is a natural manifestation therefrom. So there's a certain kind of bypass going on here when you have a number of people who are hitherto social entrepreneurs, who pivot towards something that's a little more philanthropic. 
even if we're charitably saying that these people are doing so in non-egoic ways, which I think is highly unlikely in most cases, but let's be very charitable, there's still a missing, there's still they're still perpetuating the idea that they're here to act, here to act. When all the great wisdom traditions say that we're here to contemplate first, action flows from contemplation. I'm giving this talk. It's uh, you can call it an action if you want to, but it's not my reason for being. My reason for being is contemplation of ultimate things, and the talk itself flows therefrom. So you end up having a certain foundation or basis for your actions. So that's one way of running the argument. Many of you probably won't find that compelling, but you have to sit with these for a while because it's going counter to the sort of common sense you've learned in tech and finance circles and in our universities today. Another, another way of running the argument is to say that I don't think there's really a viable karma yoga available to us. The Bhagavad Gita speaks of three real paths, the path of knowledge, jnana, the path of faith, devotion, love, bhakti, and the path of like work or deeds, but it's like deeds, I think. That's karma yoga. It's very hard to live that path. It's a highly stringent standard according to which all actions are those from which you're detached. There's complete non-attachment, complete non-attachment. And in ways I can't really spell out during the course of our short time together, there is a complete jettisoning or letting go of the idea that I'm the doer. So I'm not even the doer. Everything is just happening. That's karma yoga. There is no sense, so as, as Buddhists would say, uh, for those on the Mahayana uh, Buddhist path, for those who are bodhisattvas, this is going to sound kind of weird for those who aren't familiar with this language. There is no actor. There is no acting. There is no recipient. There is no giver. There is no giving. There is no recipient of the gift. That's non egoic. <laughs> that is non egoic action. It must be coming from, so to say, some other place that provides it with justification. Otherwise, it just sounds like nonsense. But it's not nonsense, I assure you. So, the, the short answer is that there's an order of operations problem, there's an unwillingness to think deeply about the shape and substance of life with the result that one simply pivots to more action. And that action has a similar structure from that which it had before when one was involved in corporate life and when one is now involved in a nonprofit life. One before was uh, a CEO and now one is a spiritual coach. One has to be very careful with the way in which patterns of thought and feeling continue to reconstitute themselves in the absence of deep, deep introspection. And I can absolutely see that in my own life. And as many, there are a lot of people from the Rad Reads community here where, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to be really good at finance and, you know, oh, that's empty. <laughs> so let me go be really good at entrepreneurship. Like, guess what? That's empty too. It's like, let me go be really good at surfing. Like, oh, turns out that's empty as well. Uh, let me be really good at being a dad. I'm like, oh, that's less empty, but it's not it. <laughs> and so this kind of, the, the pattern just metastizes into, a, like it looks to like, like cling to a different um, activity until, you know, finally you like throw your hands up and you're like, you're like, what the fuck is the point of all this? <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, that's exactly where you. That's exactly where the process actually begins. Yeah. Then you can then you can start. Until that time, it's waywardness. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. Happy to open it up. If anyone wants to zoom hand raise, um, get in the hot seat. We've got fifteen more minutes. I know Ben had asked, can you define, I don't even know how to pronounce eschatological. Oh, eschatological. Uh, yes. uh, it's funny. Um, that was the adjective, uh, esch eschatology. Eschatology. So I think that, uh, so there are lots of varied premises here in this talk, 30 minutes to uh, shake you up some, hopefully, rattle a bit. Uh, so not every term is defined. 
so one such is eschatology. Um, you can find some definitions online. It's basically a doctrine of salvation. It's going to depend on the tradition. Salvation, liberation, freedom. So to put it in Buddhist terms, the eschatology comes in the Four Noble Truths. This is founded upon by, by Shakyamuni, the Buddha. The first one is that life is, I'm saying these very quickly. Um, this would all need to be uh, glossed. The first one is that life is suffering, life is dukkha. That's, a, that's the statement of our predicament, the situation we find ourselves in. You might, you might quibble with that, but if you really looked at this closely and interpreted it very clearly, you'd find that, wow, it's actually true. This one leads to the second, which is that uh, there is a cause or source of suffering. I'm a little more, I'm a Vedantin here, so you, the Buddha will say craving, uh, selfish desire. I happen to think the ignorance, avijja in Sanskrit is the correct term here, but that's another long discussion. Third, there is an end of suffering, nirvana or nibbana, a cessation of all suffering. And fourth, there's a path, the Eightfold Noble Path from suffering to liberation. That's one example of an eschatology. And the reason I provide it to you is that it's so neat, it's so concise, it's so pithy, but there are others. All of them, however, I think agree that there, there's a problem with, if I may speak in old fashioned language, the problem of man is finitude. That is the problem is a sense of being limited somehow, limited by cognitive capacities, limited by the capacity of the will, volition, limited by uh, understanding, limited by seemingly being inside this body. And there are all these sorts of things beyond this body that might be antagonistic to it. In any case, all of them agree, I would say, upon some account of finitude or limitation. And therefore, all of them try to suggest that this apparently limited form, either A is not actually limited or B is situated properly within a larger order. You might say this is what undoes the fear of death. The fear of death is owing to limitation. So this is kind of what eschatology does. It expands and dilates. It allows there to be a full knowledge or understanding. So I suggested a certain kind of eschatology, or at least I hinted at one when I said that happiness defined in ways that are very different from what Thomas Jefferson would have said in his post-enlightenment stance actually refers to knowledge of God. That's putting my gauntlet down, as it were. Uh, other questions? Oh, so I should say that the problem with modernity is that it doesn't provide us with an eschatology. I'm going to read. Do you want me to read? I'll read James' question. <clears throat> I'd love to hear more about your reason for, quote, for being, end quote. I believe you said to contemplate uh, all things. That feels very foundational. How might one find their reason? Or would religious truths, truths lead us all to having a very similar reason, if not the same reason? Um, I guess there are a few questions there, at least by my lights. Uh, the, the, the first one is, um, what provides the sufficient motivating force to even begin? Uh, that is, why would you even, somehow something got you, got you here today. You can ask the question, what is it that brought me here today? Sounded interesting, nothing else to do, et cetera, but dig deeper. Why did you come? Intellectual pabulum, consumption of more information. You could eat while watching. Maybe there was a deeper reason. So you keep investigating. There must be something that brings you to sit here for an hour. Uh, and I think that there are two levers that, that seem to be pulled in life. One is the suffering lever. And this is the one that Buddhism and Christianity also underscore. Buddhism, I think, says it quite nicely. It's just, you get the sense if you meditate at all long enough, or if you are able to at least watch rising mind frequently enough, that there is this dis-ease, this dislocation, the sense of offness. It starts to feel very uncanny, you feel very homeless, confused, slightly or quite, quite so. 
that's the that ends up operating as a kind of force or mechanism that generates the interest in the inquiry in the first place. <laughs> I don't want to suffer anymore. And then you try out all these sorts of things that don't work. Uh, you try out self-help literature and it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you get a certain kind of lived neti neti. It's not this, this doesn't work and that doesn't work and that doesn't work and so forth. My suffering is still here. Attenuated perhaps, but still here. So the second, the second lever, which is more elegant, is that you start to become very interested in the desire for truth. Um, I like to put it this way. It's, it's, you can either watch The Wizard of Oz, the movie that is, and be very interested in um, the Yellow Brick Road, Ruby Slippers, various flying creatures, the Emerald Palace. That's what it's called. It's been many years since I've seen this. Or you can start to ask, what the hell made this all possible? Who is this Wizard of Oz? What, what is it that generated this, this dreamlike world in the first place? And that's, you know, is there a possibility of somehow getting beyond phenomenal experience? Sights and sounds and tastes and touches and thoughts and feelings and so forth. So those two motivations, I think, start working in tandem. Suffering is one lever, what lever rather, and, and truth is the other. Um, so that sort of answer, doesn't quite answer the question, how do you find your reason for being? But I, I find the, the, the triple method of Advaita Vedanta to be helpful when it comes to finding one's reason for being, if one is interested in religio or starting to become religious in religio. Uh, so I'm just gonna to appeal to it now. This is one methodology, I think it's a pretty good one. The first is you begin reading genuine sacred literature, sacred literature, like the Upanishads. That is a sacred text. Uh, so I'm, I'm not talking, or the Tao Te Ching. Some of these pieces of literature are high octane. They're extraordinary in their conciseness and their intelligence and their straightforwardness. The works of Shankara, who was a, a important Vedanta of the eighth century, powerful. Uh, we, can, we can refer to others as well. You read those, but you read them not with a view to trying to grapple with them. I call it soaking in. You let them soak in. They're more than poetry, but they have a poetic dimension as well. You want to see whether they reach you in some way. The Tao Te Ching seems impenetrable for someone who's first tried to read it, but it catches you. It sort of insinuates itself into you if you keep reading it. The second part of the, the Vedanta method involves pondering or contemplating. You're finally at a point to use the mind properly. You begin to say things like, well, how can this be consistent with that? How can there be suffering? Uh, if there is this thing called a God, why can't science confirm or disconfirm it? Things of that sort. You can ask all those important questions. And there are answers that, are, that have come up with. Uh, in the Vedanta, they, they usually come in the form of a satsang, where you'd see, you start to see you have a questions of a teacher. Um, and there are all these books that actually consist of satsangs. They're great questions asked to extraordinarily important uh, teachers. So the second part involves a kind of conceptual grappling, a clarifying, it would be very, very clear. And then the third part is meditation, the, the non-conceptual investigation of the real, of the most high, or if you prefer of consciousness. I have found that this, this is a nice methodology for finding my reason for being. Apart from that, I would say, uh, when it comes to the actual way this looks in practice, it's life tends to be fairly itinerant and zigzaggy. So if you want to speak with Hume, you're looking for synchronicities, certain kinds of moments that are revel revelatory, that provide you with clues that you're headed in the right direction. Apart from all I've said, by the way, it's very helpful to have uh, uh, friends and teachers who are indicating to you that you are moving along the right path. But friends and teachers are really hard to find at this moment in modernity. Genuine friends, friends of virtue and genuine teachers. So that will have to be investigated as well. Because we still have a few more minutes, I'm happy to entertain one more question. Mm -hmm. someone last, last one from um, Ganesh. Ganesh asks, I think I'm financially secure. I live with my family. 
having a wife and two sons, parentheses, students. We are healthy. However, I always have some insecurity about the future. I'm not, I'm not pretty sure why this is. Any pointers to understand why this is and eventually come out of this suffering? Okay. A uh, very brief tutorial on uh, my go-to here is uh, some scars from the Sanskrit. Here's a very, very, very good tutorial because we have three minutes. Uh, the first thing is you noticed your suffering. Uh, next, begin to gather evidence so you can see particular ways in which that insecurity or anxiety shows up. When do you find it? When don't you? So you want to really gather evidence. And the easiest way to look would be in the following manner. Look at thoughts and feelings that have the following characteristics. They're intense, somewhat intense, repetitive, and they give rise to reactivity. Hopefully you know what I mean by all that. If not, you can uh, ask me a question over email. So now you have your you now you have your data set, so to say, and then you're going to begin to ask the question, and uh, I can point you to some things uh, that I've written on the score. You're going to begin to ask the question to see where did this come from. So the hypothesis I have, you can confirm it or disconfirm it in your experience, is that every single form of suffering comes from an ego self or a samskara. That is, there must be an ego self or some scar, using them identically here, there must be an ego self or some scar in order for there to be any dukkha, any suffering, like anxiety, insecurity, et cetera. So you need to find that some scar. It has a particular character. So I put it in terms of an I am this, I am powerless, I am. So it has a psychological char character, if you prefer. I am powerless, I am hopeless. Uh, I'm a fuck up. I am a failure. Uh, there are there are a number of these basic forms. Once you pinpoint that, then you no longer have to worry about the anxiety or insecurity. You can, as it were, let that go because every time it comes up, you want to see it as indicating the samskara. Then you'll learn how to let go of the samskara. You discovered it, then you need to learn how to let go of it. Once you learn how to let go of it, not once or twice, but 500 or 1,000 times through practice, then the whole structure will attenuate. You should see the following. Firstly, you should see less evidence of intense, repetitive, and reactive suffering here understood in terms of anxiety, insecurity, and so on. And second, you should actually find less of a sense of this samskar or ego self it should be really quite weakened or withered or attenuated with the result that you should have greater quietness, clarity, openness, spaciousness, as Tibetan Buddhists would say. My three-minute tutorial actually made it. Uh, I'll 